Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us now that everyone can hear me. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that we're recording tonight. So uh, if anyone has an issue with that, please leave it in the chat, but usually it's uh, it's fine, uh, but you know, just need to check. Uh, so I just want to start off with uh, respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. These are the traditional owners of the land in which I'm hosting from tonight. But in the spirit of reconciliation, Ocycling acknowledges the traditional custodians of countries throughout Australia, as we know you're from all over the place, and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So welcome to the Oz Cycling Nights of Suburbia and Love Me Love You Mental Health Webinar number two. Uh, Love Me Love You, uh, as you know, is a not-for-profit organisation which we're uh, supporting during Mental Health Month and hopefully for um, many more months and years to come. Um, they provide interactive and engaging programs that challenge the views and stigmas surrounding mental health. Its founder, Lance Piccioni, he joins us tonight again. So welcome, Lance. Uh, okay. love, love you programs. Are, are, they're based on Lance's experiences and are aimed at educating and empowering um, our community about the importance of mental health and, and the wellbeing journey. And that's why we're here tonight. Um, before introducing our special guest, please remember to type questions in the chat. We hope you have many of them. We'll get to as many as we can, and we might have time for, for questions from you uh, vocally uh, later as well. Uh, our special guest tonight is Hannah McDougall, or Dr. Hannah McDougall. She's an uh, elite athlete, elite para-athlete, dual Paralympian, bronze medalist, inclusion advocate, author, and has completed a PhD in wellbeing. Nickname is Han, so Han. Welcome. Um, you've got uh, you've got a love for all things cycling. We know you've done other sports as well, but on your bio it says all things cycling. So we love that being a cycling crowd. Uh, great life quote: life riding for smile, riding for purpose, ride in the moment. I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that. Um, soon I'll hand over to Lance. We'll have a chat with with, with you, Hannah. But before doing so, uh, formally welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, you're a renowned motivational speaker, a great storyteller. Uh, to start off, I have two questions. Uh, can you give us a one minute, if it takes longer, it doesn't matter, just overview of your story? And please, 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 I want you to share your hurdle story because uh, I've heard it. It's, uh, if I could say it, it's a pisser. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cracker. So um, over to you, Hannah. Thanks, Ag, and thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, it's a really, it's a big pleasure to be here. And if I could also pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people, uh, who are the traditional owners on the land of which I am coming to you all from tonight, and also recognise their 60,000 plus years that they have in terms of expertise and resiliency of dealing with floods and fires and their culture so I'm just in awe and I think there's a lot that we can learn from them um, in that space so uh, yeah I think um, I've had a few interesting conversations with people recently about tonight and I think the theme song is going to be Johnny Farnham take the pressure down because everybody's like oh yeah and there'll be laughs and there's this epic hurdle story and all the things so whew, excuse me if I'm uh, sweating up a little bit of a storm over here good job you can't see my sweaty armpits at the moment uh <laughs> but in an in a nutshell I, I Yes, there, there was a swimming career for 10 years. I kind of saw the light and decided that it was nice to not smell like chlorine and have wet hair all of the time and decided to swap sports uh, and really wanted to stick away from an early morning water-based sport. So naturally, I, I picked cycling. However, uh, thanks to my coach and some of the goals that we've had, uh, Nick, shout out, um, you know, cycling has sometimes been an early morning water-based sport as well. Uh, I, I don't recommend having a crash a few weeks out before trying to qualify for a Paralympic Games and somehow karate chopping your own kneecap open with your own prosthetic cycling leg down to the patella and needing an ambulance and going in for surgery. Um, so don't put that on your to-do list. But as part of that journey, I've been lucky enough to be supported by so many beautiful people. So I've been on a, a Victorian Institute of Sports scholarship since 2002. 
I think I am currently there longest serving scholarship holder. Uh, they have seen me grown up, grow up, I should say. And I, I remember walking in and having my first meeting with Bernadette Sirikowski, who was the athlete career and education advisor uh, at the time and filling in the paperwork. And they had workshops that you could sign up for. So things like, you know, yoga and meditation or balance in sport and life and elite athlete thinking. And there was probably about 20 workshops on offer from memory. <laughs> and anyway, she looks at my paperwork and uh, she just cracked herself laughing because she's like, oh, Han, I see you've kind of ticked everything here. Uh, you know, we might need to just kind of pace ourselves a little bit. And I think that's probably a little bit of a testimony to my personality. I like to grab opportunities with two hands and one foot and mm. uh, make the most of life. Um, so, yes, there's been a sporting career. I've embraced the the love of learning and, and done the PhD, and I'm so bloody glad I'm finished that one. Uh, I'm now at least 10 foot tall, taller, and now I work for the, the State Emergency Service in the Community Resilience Directorate. So creating behaviour change and, and helping to create more resilient communities for um, storms, floods, et cetera. And uh, if you didn't know, it only takes 15 centimetres to float a small car, so never drive on flooded roads. That's the size of an average pen. So I'm planting that seed for you all tonight. <laughs> so I think I'll leave it there in terms of a bit of an overview. And... Um, very briefly, uh, if we can go back to the, the famous hurdle story that Ag mentioned before. So I did, before my swimming career, I started out in athletics at Duncan McKinnon down in, in Melbourne, uh, probably about 5Ks where I currently am. And I, my mum, who was, who was and still is one of my biggest supporters she wanted the best for me and my desire to make a Paralympic Games and become a Paralympian so she tracked me down a coach by the name of Don Elgin and I'm sure quite a few of you who are on this call at the moment have come across Donnie because he's a bit he's not only famous in the sense that he's a Paralympian multiple medals from the games he's also the world's biggest larrikin I believe always up for a laugh uh, and full of energy, full of life. And he's one of those people that you you have a conversation with and you leave feeling energised. So Donnie came down to Little Athletics on a Saturday morning to watch me do this uh, a few rounds and one of them was a hurdles race. And so... Uh, it's a bit of an amputee thing. I've been led to believe um, in that we name our legs to differentiate them. So my left leg is called Brutus. So that's my full leg and it does everything by brute force. Uh, my Generally, when I'm being lazy on the bike, it's a 70% left leg contribution, 30% right leg. Um, and then the right leg is called Julius Caesar because it has to do everything by strategy, uh, recruit muscles a bit more correctly and all of the things like that. And ironically, recently, uh, we've all had COVID brain, right? And, uh, I was with a mate and trying to get the, the setup technology, right? To watch, remember the Titans and, um, I'm pushing the remote control to, to try and get it across to click enter. And he's like, can, you know, click to the right and then just go down. And I'm like, I am, I am clicking. I'm clicking it. I'm clicking it. And he's just like, can your other right. Wow. <laughs> and so I was telling somebody this story and they're like, how can you get your left and your right so mixed up when you have the most obvious uh, kind of, you know, you're missing your right leg. How do you get that wrong? <laughs> I'm like, mm. Yes, okay, still learning at 34 years of age. So anyway, um, we, we line up for this hurdles race and, you know, nine-year-old Hannah is absolutely pissing her dax uh, that there's this Paralympian watching her do this race and geeing myself up. The gun goes off and I run as fast as I can to this first hurdle and <laughs> so Brutus clears the hurdle, no worries, 
Julius Caesar not quite cottoned on to the fact he can't bend at the ankle. And so I clip the top of the hurdle and I fall flat onto the ground and blood spurting out of my knees. My cheeks are so red with embarrassment that this Paralympian has just watched me fall flat on my face. And so, you know, learn from past mistakes, pick yourself up, run as fast as you can to this next hurdle. And I tried to kind of do this sideways scissor kick hurdles, um, you know, that high jump. I employed a high jump technique to try and get over that hurdle, which doesn't work. I don't advise that. And so then I run as fast as I can to the next hurdle and I tried to go around it but apparently that's legal so you can't use that strategy either uh so anyway run 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 get to the end of the race look behind me trail of destruction uh, destruction if anybody remembers uh wild coyote from looney tunes that was pretty much what my lane looked like whereas everybody else was probably more aligned with um you know, Princess Mary and all all quite nice lined up, uh, petite, et cetera, et cetera. So I walked really slowly up to Donnie, just dragging my feet, just full of shame, disappointment and failure. And he goes to me, well, Han, how do you think that race went? And, you know, there was kind of crickets sounding in the background with my lack of enthusiastic response. And he said to me, well, you know, I thought it went pretty good. And I was just like, <laughs> Donnie, you know, were you watching me or, or the person next to me? Um, because I just completely and utterly, you know, that was a, a failure. And, I mean, you know, I was nine and ten. I didn't know swear words at that stage. Um, and he said, well, no, if you can shame, show me that same perseverance and determination in achieving your dream, your goal of becoming a Paralympian, then you're going to make it. So he nicely shuffled me away from hurdles and into swimming, which was probably a very good move. We left me, we were left hurdles for someone else. Um, and then things just started to, to take off from there. So uh, it was a pretty epic introduction into Paralympic sport um, but one that I, I definitely don't regret. Wow. So that was a long 60 seconds, Han. My bad. You are talking to a PhD doctor, <laughs> a person who can babble for a 100,000 word thesis. So really, uh, LP, you've got your job cut out for you tonight. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks, Doc, mate. I, um, I never get sick of hearing yet, that's for sure. Uh, for the amount of times, for the, the length that I've known you, uh, the, I always walk away from our chats um, very much enthused about what life could be like. So it's um, it's a, a good reminder. And I think, as I said, the the pressure is on you because you know, as I said, I pumped you up, I pumped you up over the uh, in the lead up to this uh, webinar to say about the the knowledge bombs that will come, or the many laughs that will come, and making sure that we put things in perspective, right? So I think you have a great, uh, great ability to do that. And, you know, you, you talked about there before uh, the, the great Donnie Elgin. Um, you know, I had a, a, an experience with Donnie back in the back in the day when I was playing footy. Um, Donnie's a Hawk supporter um, and uh, he came down to Hawthorne training, did the whole talk, did the whole thing, did all his tricks, showed the legs, did all that sort of stuff and then come out on the, uh, come out on the training track um, uh, with us. Um, so actually trained with us one day and, and, and that was never done. You, you would never actually have other people do that. And, and we, uh, the boys were allowed, like, allowed that sort of position to happen, to have him uh, come train with us. Um, and it was an amazing experience because, you know what, that night that he came and trained with us, absolutely pissing down, muddy as you couldn't, uh, with the, bloke, the blokes with the, the two legs and the long st stops, couldn't stand up and uh, couldn't stop slipping over. And just to watch uh, Donnie uh, slipping all over the shop was <laughs> It's actually quite a funny experience, but uh, and then I actually was able to, I was lucky enough that I actually got to sit next to him. I uh, wasn't playing that week, um, and got to sit next to him uh, and have a good chat with him. So it was, um, we said it's amazing the experiences and, and the, the memories that you take from um, meeting certain people. And, and Donnie's one of those guys, so and I put you up in one of those as well as one of those people, and so it's um, you know, so we're honored. Uh, I think Oz Cycling's honored to have you as a, as a part of uh, this series tonight. Um, and VIS is also honoured to have you as a, we're going to go a life membership, life scholarship. 
<laughs> yeah, um, maybe I can suggest that to Anne Marie for the awards this year. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, see how long you can go for. Uh, and Carol said in the message that, that you've just beaten her by five years. Um, so, and, and Carol's been a supporter of the Love Me Love You Foundation in the past, and done a, done a ride. I think it was uh, the Murray Murray Bridge ride or something like that. Murray to Murray or something ride. No, she was a part of a team up there. So, but you know, I appreciate that. But Han, let's bring it back. As you said going over that probably that learning experience from that hurdle, being told this is not for you. This is not it. This is not it. Uh, maybe swimming's the thing. Then you've gone into a serious level of swimming. Um, and become a world record holder, mind you. Many people uh, sort of leave that one out of the bio, which is a pretty huge thing to uh, leave out, I reckon. Um, how did you take that? And where, like, what was your learning experience going from? I know I want to be an athlete. I want to do this. This is what I want to do. But then being told, no, nah, swimming is your thing, and then get into it and become the champion that you were. Yeah. Um, so I was... Lance, I think if we look back at any athlete's journey and although you see them perhaps in individual sports and sometimes team sports um, performing alone, you know, it takes it takes a village for, to get an athlete to that elite stage and I'm pretty sure we all now know just how important connection is. Uh, especially after the past 18 months and, you know, big shout out to the Melburnians who have gone through um, <laughs> some of the world's longest lockdowns, uh, which has well, been an interesting time. Holders. Talk about world record holders. We got it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure when we're going to get that the, the record back for the world's liv most livable city, but, you know, that's okay. Future ambitions. Um, but as part of that journey... Uh, one of the key people in that, well, not only my mum, but when I was 11 years old, mum remarried uh, my stepdad, John Horsfield, and I, <laughs> pretty much the next couple of months I started to seriously train for swimming and that required getting up at 12 minutes past four every single morning. And so... Uh, she turned around to him and said, darling, can you drive Hannah to swim training? And he's just like, yes, dear. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, master he's mastered the yes, dear over the years. Uh, so it's, it's because of John that I, I – and him being in my life um, and being able to support mum and not only in an emotional sense but a financial sense as well, like – being a single mom, raising two kids uh, who were extremely young and managing a full-time job, studying an MBA, making decisions between, you know, do I sell the house or do I sell the car? Um, and, you know, only having peanut butter sandwiches for school at lunchtime because that's all we could afford until I then moved into tuna sandwiches that. and then had no friends. <laughs> Sandwiches, we know how. Oh, no. well, as long as long as it's crunchy, um, yeah. and I'm happy to to enter into any debate uh, with anybody on crunchy versus smooth. Um, but yes, John was the one who drove me to swim training from the time I was 11 years old till I was 18 years old, and the day I got my license was the happiest day of his life. Um, he still, he still has that day marked in his, his diary and has an anniversary every year. Um, so those, those support networks are absolutely critical, uh, to an athlete and supporting them along the way, but that applies to absolutely everybody who's on this call tonight in life in general. And I recently read this beautiful, beautiful example um, of how people were connecting and especially with loved ones during the pandemic. Uh, and there was this family who, you know, they have their, they, uh, their grandpa and their dad um, in, in the elderly care centres 
and they couldn't go visit him. And so they set him up with a smartphone and literally only installed WhatsApp on it uh, oh. because he was 94. And so uh, giving him some lessons and they set up all their numbers in it. And over time, he starts using it a little bit. And each and every one of them, from the sons and the daughters to their grandchildren with the numbers in it, they started to receive a tomato emoticon every every morning. And so they were conversing with one another. They're like, are you getting this tomato emoticon every morning? And they're like, yeah, and that's it. Like there's nothing else. There's no text. There's no picture that that's kind of all we're getting and so uh, they have this conversation with their grandpa or their dad and he you know he's saying well each night I'm mentioning each and every one of you in my prayers and I want to let you know that I love you and so then they cottoned on that they're receiving what he thinks is a love heart but is actually a tomato <laughs> <laughs> and so they just, every morning they receive this tomato, they feel this sense of love from their, their dad or their grandpa. Um, so, yeah, that's been a massive part of, of the journey. And I think the longevity of that athlete career is just those support networks that I have in place. Um, so many people who bring warmth to my heart, um, bring excitement. Uh, you know, I'm super excited about a few things coming up, including, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning for the Wednesday World Edition, riding with the coach, a few other special people who might be on this call tonight. Um, I was challenged to mention the Wednesday ride at least 10 times. So at least I've got it in once. Once, you were nine to go. Um, <laughs> Uh, and heads off to uh, Johnny for getting up at 10 past four, for 10 past four, sorry, 12 past four every morning to do that. And we talk about sacrifices, you know, and, and sacrifices and, and something that I've learned over this my period of time, I speak to people like yourself, is that sacrifice is not what we give up, it's about what we give, right? So if we can flip our interpretation of how that works, it's, you know, the sacrifices are what we give to other people so that they can actually achieve. Uh, you know, it's not about what you give up for yourself because you're already, you've already lost. I believe in terms of those sorts of things, but um, you, you, family connection is a big one, and you've talked about it. You talk about it many times, and every time we actually have a conversation, you, you, you mention family all the time, as I do. You know, share, share that those values of family connection as we're going along. Who else was there apart from your coach, like the coaches? Like who's who is your who are your go tos? Like because life was a challenge. Because as, as people that don't know, you you were born without. A foot, right foot, and a bit of your right leg. That's where it started. And the challenges that would have come from that at school, because you were seen as different, yeah? And, you know, the, your sense of humour uh, now in trying to and work through these processes and, and the way you go about life is what you do now. But as a kid, it would have been quite challenging. Yeah, and... So I originally went to a private girls' school in Melbourne when I was – so pre-prep, um, and I lasted there two weeks because the girls were merciless in their uh, – essentially their bullying and their teasing for, for missing a leg. I don't actually remember, uh, but I <laughs> – uh, confirmed with mum the other night and then I transferred to another girls school and I uh, had a had a much better experience I I have friends uh there from from when I was five and we're still in contact to this day uh and then you know you get called pirate and peg leg and these things along the way and there's that that growth period where you're so super aware that you're different um, and people stare at you when you wear dresses or shorts, etc. And as a young kid, that can be pretty tough to, to take on. But Donnie, you know, he was just like, Han, is it, is it hurting you by them staring? Or, you know, perhaps they're seeing this amazing, you know, young person who's going about and living her life to the fullest. So I think I'm a big believer in how can we, reframe things along the way to help us have that 
you know, that growth mindset. And so probably some of the, the tips that I've collated over the years is, um, so for example, if we can say things like, I'm not fast enough, and then you just add a yet to the end. So I'm not fast enough yet, or I can't do maths yet. Um, we're not out of COVID lockdown yet. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think that helps to, to shift a little bit. And then also I know so many of us are feeling overwhelmed um, and exhausted and run down and perhaps shifting to, you know, when you look at that to-do list, um, you know, instead of thinking I have to do all of these things, having that shift to I get to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I get to spend time with these people who who matter to me. Um, and one of, one of those people for me, you know, a mentor has been John Burgess from Quan, and he taught me the importance of going into a conversation with the the attitude of how can I help this person rather than if you're entering a networking situation of what can I get from this person. Um, so how can we, you know, connect and go into listen and understand rather to to have our own viewpoints uh, be put across. Um, and then another one of my mentors, Carol Fox, uh, taught me the, the key phrase of, you know, it's possible that. So it's possible that I might make another cycling team or it's possible that I might go to the Paris 2024, 2024 Paralympics. Um, it's possible that uh, one day I will be able to run without pain. Uh, so we just, I think language uh, is super important when we're talking about not only an athlete journey, because, you know, there's research around um, if you're saying out loud or that self-talk in, in the gym, for example, I'm feeling really strong right now. And the amount of weight that girl, example, um, compared to if you say, I'm feeling really weak right now. There's a, a significant differential when you are using that various self-talk. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Can I just check you guys can still hear me? Because I think my yeah. microphone just can't no, pop down. You a little bit of robot there for a second, mate. But you're back. All good. Yeah, so, okay. there. so um, <clears throat> maybe your, maybe your microphone's tired. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, you talk about that, you talk about mindset, you talk about interpretation in your own language, but others' experiences, a lot of things that are in your control. Going through that experience of growing up, it's obviously taught a huge amount of resilience in terms of your experiences to move forward with, right? And then you've obviously taken that into swimming in that world in terms of the dealing with the challenges because you lose more than you win. Um, well, I know I did anyway. Um, but same thing, and then you took that and transferred that to cycling. What happened when you? What happened for you to get sick of the white, that black line in the bottom of the pool? Then go, I'm going to go cycling and maybe stare up someone's bum for the rest of my career. How's that going to work? <laughs> yeah, and when there's wet roads, it's a you know it's a muddy butt as well. Yeah, um, yeah. And I always do tell people when I'm riding behind them if they're if they need new nicks because it's not it's not a happy sight staring at the, that track. Um, let's hope that never, have... never wear white nicks. Never wear white nicks. <laughs> no. Or beige for that matter, really. Um, and don't eat baked beans the night before you're going out on a group ride. Uh, never a pleasant experience. Um, so if I look back on that, uh, I had to, you know, I had a pretty amazing swimming career in terms of 04, 08 Paralympic Games, World Championships, team captain. You know, we ticked all the success yeah. boxes in terms of swimming. Um but when you're doing something just because you're good at good at it and not because you enjoy it uh, and you're dedicating so much time to that activity or sport or whatever facet of life it is, I'm a big believer that, uh, you know, I'd forgotten along the way that sport was supposed to be fun and I had so many signs of burnout 
Um, and, uh, but I, I knew I wanted to still go to another Paralympic Games, which is, you know, a bit of a work in progress uh, a few years later. Um, but it was a process of elimination. Um, so as we heard, uh, hurdles is not my forte. And uh, Lance, I don't know if I've told you this story, but uh, Han and Ball Sports, right. no good together. I remember back in the day, so VIS, Victorian Institute of Sport, we were working in tandem, don't know if I mentioned them, but with Essendon Footy Club as well as the Melbourne Vixens. And we were doing this program called On the Ball where we targeted year eight students and we're talking about cyberbullying and um, giving them some tips around that, et cetera. And yeah. as part of it, we had to do a training session. So we taught the Vixens and the footy boys how to play goalball, which is a unique Paralympic sport uh, played by people with vision impairment. And essentially they have like almost this six kilo medicine ball that they piff at each other at opposite ends of a court and it has a bell in it. So they've got to listen for it. And it's just absolutely nuts to watch because you're not allowed to cheer um, because they need to hear the ball and, oh, far out. Might take my, my hat and give legs up to them. Um, so we taught the boys how to play goalball and the Vixens. And then they were teaching us, you know, just some basic hand passing with the footy, et cetera, and kicking the football. And I gave the kicking the football a little bit of a whirl, but, you know, the leg generally came flying off afterwards, um, ending up in the ditch. But then they were doing handball and they're like, hand, catch. And they're like, ah, ah, ah. And I now have a Harry Potter scar on my forehead from not catching that football. And they got it on camera so every time they see me, they're like, oh, Han, remember this moment? You're really <laughs> crappy. Um, so all ball sports were definitely out of my process of elimination for Paralympic Games. Um, and, yes, my my stump, my, my Julius Caesar side, the end of it is the size of a 10-cent piece. So all of that pressure, all running stuff kind of out the door. Um, yeah. I am having, oh, CC said it's handball, not handball. <laughs> Just let it be, Carol, yeah. let it be. Yeah, the, the terminology. <laughs> I, I, um, I always say when you're bad, so bad at something, I just let, let someone be it, right? If you, if, if you can't even say, know what it is, that's why you're probably not that good at it, right? Yeah, just feel free to pass me that shovel anytime. Um, so yes, uh, I sh hopefully having surgery soon to correct the, the leg and make it a bit better of a shape. So it kind of left cycling and rowing. Um, and I thought at the time oh, rowing yeah. was an early morning water-based sport. And so cycling sounded a lot more appealing, but as we heard earlier, cycling is also an early morning water-based sport. Oh, so, yeah. but yeah, no, I, I love cycling like Cycling is my freedom. It's my soul. Um, I get to, you know, go fast, many kilometres, come down hills like a crazy mad woman, uh, and then, you know, sit around drinking coffee with friends afterwards. I think it's a genius. Um, I'm really not sure why everyone doesn't do it. Yeah, well, those rainy, wet, rainy mornings or getting uh, jammed by cars or make pies is probably uh, been the thing that pushes a lot of people off, but you said you drive it back to that feeling of community and that's what we're always we always talk about you know from the work that we do at love me love you from the obviously the messaging that comes through from old cycling from wherever it is it's about uh, that connection into community and the thing that we've missed most of this last 18 months um as i said world record holders melbourne in the amount of days in lockdown now the, the only place in the world where someone says seven days and it goes for three months it's um it's a it's an amazing experience, but we we'll talk about that and it is uh, the idea of community and, and driving that connection into what we need. You know, you've you've taken those experiences from what you were, and said growing up to your swimming through to your until until your world champion cycling career. Um, you've had some huge challenges that have come up lately. I want to fill people in. What's happening? <laughs> ah, yeah. There's been a few. <laughs> yeah, there's been a couple of little tricky ones on the other side. So, um, 
And, and but, yeah. but more importantly, what it's teaching you. What's what's your what it's what's you learning from it? Um, well, if we look historically, I seem to have had a few epic crashes every two years or so. So we kind of started on a bit of a downward trajectory from the 2016 <laughs> World Championships in South Africa where I um, hope there's no Polish people on the line, but essentially the Polish rider uh, chopped my front wheel and we're going 45k an hour awesome. and I ricocheted through the peloton um, and then decided to come home and uh, change a few things in life. Uh, found out mum had terminal cancer. She was given three weeks to live. Four years later, she's still going okay. <laughs> so that goes to show that uh, you can't believe yeah. what the doctors say. Yeah. Um, but it's been a, a pretty massive roller coaster. Um, and I think there's been so many learnings in terms of, you know, appreciating that as West, like as a Western white Anglo-Saxon female, uh, you know, we're not so good at talking about death in our society. Um, and so getting a little bit more uh, open and authentic and, you know, there's there's a tidal wave coming for mum, but we don't know when that is. So to really, you know, that reinforces the importance of family and living living every day making the most of those opportunities um and then going through uh essentially you know putting my body into starvation mode through eating enough carbohydrates and putting on eight kilos um and then having to to relearn to appreciate carbs and and build them back in and it was during that time period that I also discovered tai chi and qigong which I absolutely I love my mental health and well-being because it's the absolute opposite of, you know, cycling in terms of pushing myself and achievement and going fast. This is slow and I'm I'm terrible at it uh, and it, it challenges me in such a different way just to press pause and, and tap into that parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and, yeah, then more, more recently um, – a lot of a lot of leg issues uh, on Stumpy, Mr. Elephant, year four mascot, because you know when you chuck on a hat and glasses, he looks like an elephant's trunk. Um, so yeah, there's been everything from poor circulation and turning blue for de for days on end to excruciating blisters and skin breakdowns and and living the past 18 months in a wheelchair essentially outside of on the bike because we prioritized cycling uh, and aiming to qualify for Tokyo um, and life was you know walking was secondary <laughs> cycling was cycling was number one and wow. um, so I've been become quite creative with that wheelchair and and crutches and all of the things there and then yeah, more recently um, having knee injuries and then obviously missing out for for Tokyo after having that epic crash on the Q Boulevard um, on a on some wet roads and having some mud and oil take out that front wheel and and <laughs> I I was doing an effort and I'd just overtaken a few guys on the bike and there was a car coming and I'm moving left and the front wheel comes out. And I, I, you know, do this epic kind of circle with bikes going everywhere and somehow in between the, the prosthetic karate chopping my kneecap open, it comes off and flies off. So the guy behind me, he pulls up and he's just like, that was epic. And I'm like, well, did you get it on GoPro? Because I could probably make some money out of this. But no, my next my – next, <laughs> Um, instruction was quick call an ambulance I've got to qualify for Tokyo next week uh, and he just thought I was mad because you know there's this patella that you can see um, and we did give it everything we gave we gave it uh, yeah we we pulled out all the stops um, Nick worked every single magic trick that he knew but we just didn't quite get there in the end um, and yeah there was some super tough moments uh in terms of not walking and being so exhausted and emotionally stressed i remember 
sitting at the bottom of my stairs um, each night and bawling to try and then work up the energy to bum shuffle up these stairs to my bed each night um, and then try and try and go again tomorrow, uh, being in that physical pain, but also just mentally under the weather like everybody else. Um, so, yeah, there's been some pretty dark days and you know when showering is an achievement for the day that you're probably not so good and lucky enough to have the most beautiful boss who, you know, you're crying down the telephone, you're like, I can't do this anymore, Susan. She's like, I, can't, I need some time off. Hand, take whatever time you need. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. Just stop crying, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then to now, from there. Um, yeah, I think I probably I'll bring into this conversation um, Mike Rolls, who's a double amputee. So he was a, uh, a young, talented footy player and went away to Tassie for a footy trip when he was 18 or 19 and essentially woke up in hospital a few weeks later with one of his legs amputated, some of his ears amputated, bit of his nose amputated um, because he had contracted, um, oh, Mike, don't kill me if I get this wrong, but meningococcal. Um, but the he was essentially... He's very lucky to be here. He died almost nine times during that period. Um, and then for the next nine years, he had an infected left foot. And after nine years, made the decision to, to amputate his foot. And he explains in his book, um, you know, what's what's your dead weight that's, that's keeping you down? Is it, you know, a physical item? Uh, body part or is it something financial is it people in your life is it um, your work etc and how when we prune things away and we uh, we start to simplify things we can actually have a lot of growth and so talking with a few people we've recognized the fact that you know we've been doing a lot of band-aid fixes and being very creative However, we haven't fixed the root cause of the problem, which in a nutshell is that my leg is a shit shape for a prosthetic leg. Uh, and so, okay, well, let's have some surgery to fix that root cause. And so fingers crossed and five toes, I'll be heading in next week for some pretty epic surgery to chop off a few inches of my leg. And I think I've bought this upon myself by making way too many leg jokes and, you know, she'll be right. We can just chop it off uh, over the years. Um, and it's now happening. Um, so, yes, I've, I'm in the hands of some three very good plastic and orthopedic surgeons uh, next week. Um, and then it'll be a, a three-month, three to four-month rehabilitation process where I'll be doing a lot of wheelchair pushing. Um, and ironically, probably once my wounds heal, I'll be swimming um so that'll be an interesting challenge um and then uh yeah getting back on the bike when I can um so looking forward to going for a ride with everyone when that happens but also recognizing um that there is also a pretty epic event coming up um the ride with me in a few weekends time over cup weekend uh, and while I won't be on my bike then, I will be massively cheering everyone on from the sidelines. Uh, so, yes, to anybody who is fundraising um, and doing some riding, whether it be, you know, 400 kilometres or bloody, I don't know, Lance, what will you be up to by then? Seven times up the Alp on, on Zwift? Um, uh, yeah, yeah about that. at least. At least by then, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It's, uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this is the thing, right? We, we talk about people's experiences, what you've been through, all sorts of stuff, and, and there's a lot of focus that goes on the shit, the shit show that is life, right? And, and we do. We attach, and people attach themselves to the stories and the connections of what 
all the crap things that have happened and understand the experiences that have been through, understand the opportunity of going through those experiences because it puts us in a position to understand where we're going moving forward. So we've got Ride With Me coming up next week and it's about being go big, it's about being all that. But you have a go big and my go big that you have go big is in 2024 is what we're aiming for. What's happening? What's happening? What is the I will thing? What is the I will statement that is going to happen for 2024? Ironically, I started learning French last year in lockdown. So I will be speaking fluent French by 2020 <laughs> in Paris at the Paralympic Games, and I will be there competing as an athlete. Uh, so um, we'll make that happen in some way, shape, or form. Um, yeah, I, I'm not done. Yeah, I'm not I'm done. Uh, you and see, see, you better be there. You, you better be there with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, you said you've got a great amount of support, a great amount of people, a great amount of experience, but it's still, there's only one person that ever can do it for yourself, and that is you. So and making that happen. So, but let's bring it back because as Carol says here, yeah, you've had a lot of dark days, and as we we attach ourselves to the dark days, and we always want to know how people get out of them. What is the thing? What is it? Yeah, we talk about consistency in your self care. We talk about we talked about your breathing practices. We talk about you're a, you're a mindfulness teacher. You're a breathing practice uh, coach. Uh, you do the acceptance and commitment therapy. You're the uh, program director for the emergency services in terms of well, but you're a PhD in well-being, you're an absolute legend. But you, like everybody else, are human, and you have your shit days. How do you trigger yourself to get out of those moments? Because I don't believe there's I don't believe there's dark days. I believe there's dark moments, right? How do you trigger yourself to get out of that? Uh, I think there's a few core pillars for me, uh, which are also quite nicely backed by a lot of evidence and science, not only Western science, but Eastern science as well, and yeah. Eastern traditions for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. So uh, one of them is sleep. Yeah. <laughs> All my friends and Amazing. family do, 9 p.m., Hannah turns into a pumpkin and needs to go to bed. So <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm out doing talks at dinners pre-COVID, um, and I'm telling people some some key strategies and how important sleep is and that, you know, the alarm goes up at 5, 5 a.m. Uh, and doing a dinner talk and sleep's important, 9 p.m., bedtime for Han. And it gets to like 8.30 on these functions and the whole audience is saying, hey, Han, you're starting to turn into a pumpkin. You need to go to bed. So it's <laughs> great it's pulling me out the door. Um, yeah. But, yeah, no, I, if anybody's interested, there's the Huberman podcast, which the first five episodes are highly detailed on sleep um, and all of, like, there's, it's just, you know, it's kind of doing an exponential curve in terms of our learnings and how critical that is and the, the routines we can associate with that. So that is a massive, massive one for me because I know – if I'm in a pretty dark moment um, and having a good night's sleep, I'll almost be like a different person the next day. Um, so that's one of them. And then also I, I think one of my strengths is, is gratitude. And so practicing that on a daily basis. And for me, COVID has really uh, rammed home just literally stopping and smelling the roses or the wisteria uh, and taking in those really small, small things, mainly probably more to do with nature on a daily basis. And I love, absolutely love, love, love Hugh Van Sillenberg from the Resilience Project, his story, how, you know, he's in India um, as, a, as a teacher volunteering and way out in a remote community uh, with a school that's literally a hut with a, a dirt floor and the first day he's a quite a tall person he walks in and bashes his head on this this beam and all the kids just 
burst out laughing and they're like, oh, sir, careful. There's another one here and there's another one here. And they're pointing out all of the beams from then onwards. Um, but the next day, one of the, the kids stands and has put up whatever he could find in terms of softening the blow of the beams for Hugh's head. So, you know, old pieces of plastic bags or foam mattress pull, pulled apart and stuck up. And he was then taken on this tour of the school and the kids are like, look at this, sir, look at this. And because he can't, uh, uh, you know, they can't pronounce TH so well. Right. And so it's yeah, this. Yeah. Um, and they're going out to the playground and like, sir, sir, look at this. And it's this, you know, rusted swing set. He's like, how on earth do they get any joy out of this? But he eventually puts together just how important that sense of gratitude is. And not only a sense of gratitude, but gratitude in the moment uh, is a really powerful tool um, and to make that really specific. So, I think uh, I really harness that 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 strength of, of gratitude, um, and and I now adopt that. I'm like, oh, it makes me smile when I'm like, look at this. <laughs> um, so that's another component. And then um, LP, as you mentioned, the mindfulness and the breath work uh, is one of my core pillars as well. Um, so I, I originally probably started out and was introduced to mindfulness by a sports psych at the VIS way back in, in 2011. Um, and she didn't call it that. And you really couldn't say mindfulness 10 years ago because people would put up a lot of barriers and be like, oh, what's that hippie woo-woo thing that you're talking about? Whereas now people are a lot more accepting and perhaps realise there's a lot of value to it, but you've also got this mindfulness uh, selling commercialism, which is horrible. So if you know if if you are listening, I would encourage you to be quite discerning in terms of um, what you read and, like everything in life, treat it as a bit of an experiment. What's going to work for you? Um, there's so many various mindfulness and breathwork techniques um and i then i studied a, a breathwork course during covid last year and i love the fact that it's quite uh prescriptive and and um you have for an athlete you know here's kind of your warm-up that you can do or you know there's what's known as as your water breath so breathing practices you can practice on a daily basis there's your coffee breathing techniques, which can G you up. And then there's your yeah, single malt whiskey techniques, which help to calm you down. Um, so there's all of all of these goodness things uh, in that pillar that I, I practice at least half an hour each day. Um, and I put that in my training peaks as a form of my training as well. So do you reckon uh, if we could take a few minutes now to perhaps just tap into our breath and some mindfulness before we... It was a couple of minutes. Doc, oh, well, I was a couple of minutes for you, and I think it's a, it's a great sort of leading towards we finish. So, uh, most definitely, let's bring it through. I don't think it's ever been done through a webinar series where we can't see everyone's faces and all that sort of stuff, and it's going to be awesome because you can only see mine and yours. Um, but let's uh, let's work it through because I know the big ag. Uh, he'll enjoy a single malt whiskey uh, breathing practice. <laughs> thought. Good, good. Speaker. Ag, it's um, it's incorporating uh, some notes of chocolate, some burnt crumpet, some marmalade. Uh, we're not going for a peaty whiskey here. We're just going for that smooth finish. All right, is that all right? That's great. I'm I'm happy. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So if I could ask everyone who was on this call tonight, uh, joining us, or if you're listening a little bit later, if you could just push your feet firmly into the floor. For and just take a moment to imagine there's a piece of string slowly pulling your spine up towards the ceiling. And if you feel comfortable to do so, because we cannot see you, I would invite you to close down your eyes. However, if this is not accessible for you to do, just pick a spot about a metre or so ahead of you and gently lower your gaze. 
And I'd like to invite you to simply tune into your breath, perhaps becoming aware of it for the first time today. Recognizing that we breathe on average 20 to 30,000 times a day, approximately every 3.3 seconds. And that as we're breathing, we can look to tap into the biggest breathing muscle of the body, which is your diaphragm. And so you may like to place your hands over your bellies and see if you can feel your breath at your belly. And so a beautiful picture that could be helpful to paint here as you inhale and exhale is that there's a balloon underneath your hands and as you breathe in that balloon is expanding and as you breathe out that balloon is deflating. And so I invite you as you're doing this belly breathing, to breathe slowly and deeply. And we're looking to have movement at the belly and perhaps not so much movement at the chest. It can be helpful to do this breathing practice through your nostrils. And knowing that as you're doing this, we are activating your diaphragm, which is connected to your vagus nerve. So not the, the party vagus over in the US, but this beautiful nerve, which innervates so many different parts of your body, including your parasympathetic digest and rest nervous system. So we're slowing down your heartbeat. We're encouraging blood flow to your stomachs after hopefully eating dinner before this session. And if we can tap into your digest and rest before bed, we're setting yourself up for sleep. And now just taking perhaps three slow, soft, deep breaths into that belly. Just going at your own rate and rhythm. And once you've finished your three breaths, just letting your breathing return to its own, its own natural pace. And just slowly bringing yourself back into the space in which you've been practicing. So perhaps a little bit of movement, wiggling some fingers, some toes, opening your eyes when you feel ready to do so. And just bringing yourself gently back to the screen. So welcome back everyone. It was a very short practice. However, we can, start to clear our bloodstream of uh, adrenaline or cortisol, um, our stress hormones, just even by doing 60 seconds by focusing on our breath. So I love the physiological science behind these techniques, um, but then also the way they can make you feel. So I hope that was a little helpful for you all. Um, and where would we like to head to now to wrap up, team? Always, Ripper. Uh, Han, Doc, you're, you're a champion. I am, um, as I said, the experiences. I, I personally do a lot of met my from this and breath work practice through my days. And I know that the, cons the consistency and practice that it needs to be done is not a thing that you do once a week. And hopefully, uh, you're creating benefit in who you are and how you go about things. Um, and I know if, from a professional sports point of view, um, it's right through to our community members. Um, there has been a lot more engagement in this. As I said, there is, you talked about before, to be careful what the commercialization of this looks like for a lot of people, um, because we, we're now in a world um, that everyone with an Instagram profile is an expert in what 
life's about. Um, and, and I think for the people out there listening, whether it's tonight or in the future, just understand that, just be understanding of the information that you uh, read or take in and how you process that and how you take that on. And that's from anything from uh, right through from mindfulness or breathwork practice, right through some mental health resources, right through the cycling tips and coaching expertise that has uh, always been passed on from uh, the so-called experts of life. But it is about how you interpret that information and how you take that information, utilising that experience to move forward. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about the words that are inter that sh shown through to us and the experiences that had from that. And, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that everyone that's listened tonight and watched uh, over this session, the, the experiences that obviously that you've been through hand from and, and the learnings that you've taken from that and been able to communicate tonight. Um, you know, as I said, from everyone at Love Me, Love You, uh, you know, from a cycling you speak, uh, Ag, uh, we're very honoured and, and humbled with the fact that uh, you'd be able to join us. Uh, and be a part of our world because you leave a, uh, as I say, you leave a positive imprint on, on what our day and our nights can be. So, very much appreciative of all of that. But you ride with a, ride with a smile, ride with a purpose, and ride in the moment. That's I think the uh, same sums you up in every little sweet which way. So much appreciative uh, of you and everything that you do. So mate, uh, I look forward to connecting more as we go along. In this crazy world and then watching you on uh watching you in 2024 and actually joining you for one of these wednesday rides that uh so-called uh famous uh and you can stare at my uh see-through nicks uh one day <laughs> see how that all goes eh? <laughs> yes uh don't worry um nick will be very excited that you're joining us for one of the wednesday rides and i think um maybe if i can just finish on it's this beautiful 10 second poem from a Japanese pearl diver just on, you know, we live in a individualistic consumerism now, now, now society, but we, you know, things that are worthwhile, we have to work hard for. And she says, uh, a deeper dive, no one dives to the ocean bottom just like that. One does not learn the skills involved at the drop of a hat. It's those skills slow learnt in the depths of love that I am working on. And she wrote that in the early 8th century. So, yes, things do take time. Um, and I love the work that Love Me, Love You is doing. Uh, I love the fact that we're focusing on mental health and we're able to have more meaningful and rich conversations now around this amazingly important topic. Um, and I, yeah, very grateful for this opportunity to speak to everyone tonight. So, thanks, team. Good job. Well played. Ag. Yes. Um, how, how do you follow that up, mate? Oh, you, 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 just say, you just say thank you and you just um, – and I, I'm truly honoured and the comments coming through um, suggest I'm not alone. Um, Hannah, thank you so much. And uh, Lance, um, really well facilitated as, as, um, as we got used to. A couple of – you know, I like to end these things with just a couple of quotes that really grabbed me. Not dark days, dark moments. Gratitude in the moment. Uh, just, just, just wonderful lines. I, you know, I love the fact that you can, you, you, you're vulnerable and open, but also you, you use humour, Hannah. Um, you know, way too many leg jokes. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I, think, I think all of this just uh, it, it gives us this, um, <laughs> it gives us this, uh, this sense of, um, of, uh, I guess it, you make us calm. And and I, and I and I think that's really important. Taking a deep breath, the breathing exercise was great. The, the comments about and the tips about sleep. I love the fact that Carol's joined us, and and Carol was able to um, put some comments in. There's the there's the book. It's great. Uh, uh, yeah, the plug. Yeah, and uh, I just looked it up on on readings. My favourite bookshop in Melbourne, thirty two dollars ninety nine. I noticed, so you can uh, you can order that, and it's in stock too, Carol. So it's three days delivery. So that's not bad. Um, and we wish you all the best too, Carol. It's great to have you home, and and that you, um, you know, you're recovering from um, from the fall in in, in Tokyo. Uh, we were all well, we're all feeling it, and uh, it was one of those moments that we went, oh, hope she's okay, and and we, we're we're so glad you are, and uh, and uh, Hannah Paris, yeah, speak French fluently because you'll need it because I'm absolutely sure you'll uh, you'll 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 be uh, competing. Um, I couldn't be sure, actually. Um, 
I've just not met someone with such great uh, willpower. I've met so many people in my life and everybody has, uh, I suppose, in this sport, you meet people who have got great determination, great will, but uh, you uh, you just got that little bit extra. It's just it's really wonderful to hear from you uh, and the way you express yourself. Uh, the, the, the Mental Health Month has been very important for us and, and obviously it continues. Uh, we've got some Red Cross seminars that are still going on as well. And you, along with Shane Kelly, uh, we've just had, uh, we've been blessed uh, by having you having you on and sharing your experiences and being so open. I mentioned the Knights of Suburbia at the start and also the fact that Ride With Me has been mentioned by, by you, Hannah, and I'm one of the I'm one of the people uh, taking it on as well for, uh, I think it's the third year for me. Just uh, Andrew O'Keefe sent me something earlier today just about the social impact report that was released uh, for Knights of Suburbia, and I just wanted to, to read some parts of it. So in 2021, uh, the, or 2020, 21, that year, the Knights of Suburbia community has made its greatest impact, um, obviously through one of the most difficult periods. But yeah, the mission is to change the culture around mental health through cycling, and they measure their impact through three performance indicators, creating community, elevating awareness and raising funds. I just want to talk about the funds for a minute. So the goal is to raise funds to support mental health organisations to reach more people and change more lives. And last year, or this 2020-21 year, the, um, the, their efforts raised $312,300, which is a 267% increase on the previous year. That's amazing. Um, and, and, and these aren't the only measurable outcomes. There's countless conversations like we're having now, actions, friendships that make the difference. And yeah, Knights of Suburbia is one of many, many cycling groups. Uh, and, and I know that they won't mind me saying this, that it's it's a huge group, a huge community. But when you think about it, we're, we're, we're all part of this wonderful movement called cycling. And uh, and, 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 and we know bikes change lives. So to use cycling for this purpose is so powerful. Uh, these are just amazing results. Uh, and with Ride With Me, I mentioned it last time, we've obviously got more fundraisers now, 483 Lance and $141,385 raised. And obviously no, no, no kilometers logged yet because it hasn't started. So people raising money, what do you need to add to that, mate? I think it's been the response has been amazing. As I said, the uh, the impact that this Knights of Suburbia have had uh, through us uh, at Loving Loving has been amazing. You know, last year through our Ride With Me event, we had 600 people from all over the world, $300,000, which was an amazing response to what was a, an interesting, uh, challenging experience in life. Um, you know, for the 483 so far that have signed up, we will get our 500 participant target. Um, and you know, the, the people want to know where it goes and why, and, and what it does. So, we, we and the big biggest component of where the funds go to is offering the support pathway program. So we offer a free counselling service for people to get the access to the support support, um, because there's a lot of people that are slipping through the gaps, uh, and especially at this current stage of life, um, and, and majority of the funds go to you facilitating that program. Um, which is a said, we've helped hundreds and hundreds of people this year go through that program, um, which is essentially maybe have changed and saved a certain amount of lives. So uh, knowing that work does there. So, uh, and then the, the, the awareness and education components that we're able to sort of put out into the world. Um, you know, it's it's been an amazing response once again. Um, you know, and the, the theme has been go big. It is go big. You know, and many people doing, you know, whatever go big means to them. And that's down to interpretation, as we've always spoken about. Um, and, you know, I'm really excited just to see what that looks like uh, moving forward for next week. So there's still time to sign up. There's still time to get your kit. There's still time to get involved, fundraise, whatever. It doesn't cost you a cent. It costs all your friends their money. Um, that's how it all works. And that's why we, the way we like it. Um, for those that want to join, I'm actually doing a virtual Everest on Zwift starting at 5 a.m. next Saturday. Um, next Saturday morning, I will be starting. Um, this has been an interesting experience for me, and I say this with one eye closed because I don't really actually want to see it. Um, but, uh, you know, I took up cycling two years ago, Ag, um, and uh, did that first ride with me experience uh, riding through the snow to Marysville that year. And then um, I've just gone, okay, well, cycling is now my medication of life. 
um, and, and how I go about it. I'm not that good on the road, but I'm unbelievable on a trainer. So, um, so, but if anyone wants to join, keep an eye out for what that looks like because um, be sharing because I definitely need some company as I'm doing that. I'm pretty sure. So, but as I said, back back to what we do at our cycling, um, and, and obviously the importance that you've all played on this topical issue this month, um, which we believe is yes, great month to do it because it's Mental Health Month. But every day is a love me, love you day. Okay, so make sure that we uh, we keep that messaging moving forward, um, that we're never alone. We're here to support education, resources, training is what we all need to be able to move forward. And the more we can normalise the process and language and behaviours around the mental health system, the better off we're all going to be. Um, so let's just make sure we can make that happen. So thanks very much once again. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. Tom. Thanks, Hannah. And Steph, you want to show your face? When Lance Thanks. says go big, you want it to go big with Mental Health Month. I think you nailed it. Um, this was um, this was good, uh, and it, we, it, it's, we're going to have um, lots more of this because, like I said at the start um, of last the last session, it's not a one month job; it's forever. Uh, and uh, and what we what we what we take away from this is what's important. It, we we can be good listeners, but we need to be really good at uh, at enacting what we learn as well. So thanks again uh, to to the three of you, uh, and uh, good luck with ride with me. And uh, Hannah, we'll, we'll see you out there. Um, thanks very much. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it.